So to start off, Kapil, can you discuss, if possible, maybe what you have come to understand regarding thoughts or thinking as it pertains to human performance? Knowing does not require thought. If there's a player that you have to guard, or there's a part of the field that you have to be on, or wherever you have to be or not be or do or not do, it isn't like you need to go into a thought state to figure that out and then leave the thought state and come back into no mind. That entire process is done seamlessly and entirely within the state of instinct and no thought. Thought is entirely unnecessary. Now, obviously there are times when one does need to think for utilitarian purposes, for giving out a problem or a solution to, you know, to some complex puzzle or planning or whatever it is. But in the realm of sport, that doesn't very often come into play is action-reaction. So in the state of no mind, it is not that you will not know where to go or what to do or, um, or, or not have your wits about you as to the most intelligent way to act. You will do all of those things in a far more superior fashion precisely because you were not thinking. And I don't mean, I don't, it, it, the idea that you must go into thinking and then come back out is, I would dispute that. There's the best way that I can describe it is there is just a knowing. You, if I, if I stand 10 feet to your right and you do not think, you can feel me there. You can feel my presence 10 feet to your right and you cannot explain it. You don't need to think about it. In fact, if you think about it, the less you will feel my presence because thinking is interference. So you will know that I'm there just spatially, just through your awareness. You will feel that there's someone there. It's like someone following you. You can feel when you're being followed. It's instinctive. So there's no need for the interjection of thought that creates clunkiness, that removes one from the rhythm of the situation. All sports are like martial arts. All sports are like Tai Chi. There's a flow and a rhythm to things. It is a natural state of being. It is not a thoughtful way of being because thought actually is non-being. Now, the idea of thinking as interference in many ways almost blows a hole in what we understand as modern sports psychological intervention in many ways. Yes. So yes. One, one of the areas I wanted to move into now is what you will see and what many players, coaches listening will be well accustomed to understanding or experiencing is a player saying to them that they have a lack of confidence or a fear mm -hmm. of failure or, or, or things of that nature, which can be defined in, in many ways. And, and you can maybe disagree with this, but they are thinking problems. They are, they are problems related to thinking as interference for those, those players. But, but all problems are thinking problems. <laughs> Exactly. But many, actually, most sports psychologists will solve those problems with more thinking Correct. and a prescribed version of that thinking, whether it's now they have to force themselves to think positively or to think in this way and not that way. And what we see and what we find is that that almost definitely makes the problem worse. It amplifies it. And I wanted to see if you can explain why that might be while also touching on why prescriptions like those are so ineffective. The idea of prescription, let me begin there first. 
the idea of prescriptions is such a fundamentally significant tectonic shift in the way to look at everything in coaching and sports and in everything that most will not be able to grasp it immediately, not because of any lack of intelligence, but because it is so completely counter to the culture. It is so against the norm. Everything in this society, whether it's psychotherapy, uh, dealing with emotions, uh, performance, whatever it may be, is related to the unspoken and completely accepted idea. So much so accepted that it's never even brought up. It is such a given that it's never even talked about is the idea that there is a how, there is a way, there is a five-step process. There is a do this and a do that and a don't do this and a don't do that. That is so fundamental that if someone came to you and said, I need help with X, and you did not give him any prescription he would immediately be taken aback and said, well, why, why am I here then? I expect you to tell me what to do, what to say, where I'm going wrong. But I will say that prescriptions are the poison of all art. Prescriptions forever keep one away from their ultimate potential. Prescriptions sabotage all great performance. Prescriptions are complete untruths. That which you prescribe, you sabotage, you destroy. Though the prescription may absolutely be correct, for instance, one example would be, be in the present. That is such a ridiculous statement on the face of it, is it true? Yes, it is. It is technically a true statement to be in the present. But let me tell you something. Siddhartha Gautama left his house, left his princehood, gave away his robes, and became a beggar. And he spent over 10 years in the forests of northern India, meditating for 20 hours a day, drinking his own urine and eating a grain of sand per day. And after 10 years, he couldn't live in the present. <laughs> so you're going to tell an athlete off the cuff, go live in the present. It is, it is absurd. It is absolutely laughable. It annoys me. What annoys me is people are not interested in the truth. They are just interested in passing along regurgitated easy prescriptions and tossing them upon people as if it's going to do anything. In order to affect anybody, you must get whatever you say into the bloodstream. You can shower them with all the flowery lames that you want. It doesn't work. So the idea of sports psychologists telling people to think more is correct. All of the charts and the graphs and the funnels and the self-talk and the aphorisms are all BS. It's, it's, it's complete crap. It has no relevance to anything because that is not how human beings learn. When human beings are at their best, and evidence doesn't come from me, just look at, look at, look at the evidence before you that comes from the athletes' mouths themselves. You don't typically see an athlete who has played a fantastic game say, my thinking was extraordinarily positive today. Because if it was, it's not very hard to positive think. You can positive think in 10 minutes. So that means why isn't every one of your games equally extraordinary? 
So it's not all these pie charts and graphs and 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 think positive and the three C's and the four D's. It's yet another example of human beings who are not looking for the truth, who simply want to dumb down complex ideas and throw them on people. It is an it is making things academic to the point where they have no efficacy. They're not relevant. The hallmark and the holy grail of every athlete is no thought. But even addressing that, I will tell you that as a sports psychologist, if you tell someone, don't think, you will think even more. So once again, we have yet another example that no thought is correct. To not think is correct. We just spent the first 10 minutes talking about how not thinking is the way to go. But if you package it as a prescription, it disintegrates. Not thinking is correct, but if you tell somebody don't think, it does not work. So it isn't about the message, it's about the delivery. It's about getting into the bloodstream. It isn't about telling someone. The most, the most ineffective way to get somebody to act is to tell them. It doesn't work. Well, and I think, again, everyone listening will have at one time or another had an athlete that however you want to diagnose the problem, maybe for the sake of of example, we say they have a lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. You will hear that be met by the coach, the sports psychologist, a teammate sometimes with, to take your example, oh, just don't think about it. Right, <laughs> and, and and as you said, if that if that alone solved the problem, correct, we wouldn't be probably talking today. Well, well, th- I mean, quite frankly, um, one of Buddha's disciples, all he had to had, had to say said to Buddha before it took him ten years to get enlightened was, "Hey, just get 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 enlightened ready. Hurry up." <laughs> it's the same thing, right? It, it's 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 literally the same thing, right? <laughs> So it's 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 disingenuous. It's it's unserious. This is this is fundamentally this is an unserious way of looking at a, at a problem that is fundamentally complex and deep seated, and it is much more about the human than it is about the player because there is no player. There's only a human being masquerading as a player. And the, and another fundamental problem with sports psychology is once again one that has never been questioned. But we're going to question it here tonight, and that is that the idea of improving one's performance is the wrong approach. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Performance is not a goal. If you treat it as a goal, you fail. All things that are magical, all things that are otherworldly, all things that are pure art do not come as goals. They come as side effects. Performance is a side effect of. Performance is a reaction to. What must be addressed is the state of the human being. Why his emotions arise. The perceptions which cause him to have those emotions. To pursue things from that angle, as opposed to trying to fix them. To pursue them from the back end, not the front end. All things happen at the back door. You cannot affect the tree at the level of the branch. You can only affect the tree at the level of the root. So you address the reason why things arise, the emotions arise. What is it that he's perceiving? What is the situation that he's involved in that is causing him to have X, Y, and Z be falling down 
upon him and erupting within him. As opposed to saying, let's see what we can do to make you play better. That is the wrong way to look at it. The truth is always the opposite. And the masses are always wrong. It is never about the performance. It is never about addition. It is always about subtraction. It is never about adding something to make the performance better. It is about subtracting and removing the things that are not allowing the performance to happen. Well, and, and that's the one thing that, just to, to speak to that point, that you never hear in the sports world, which is obviously why I wanted to chat with you tonight. But I believe in sports and probably in general, there's far too much credence given to things such as stress and fear and anxiety and trauma as if they are compulsory for everybody to experience these things. Mm -hmm. When that's almost undoubtedly un untrue. And yes. so the, the question I had here is where can we maybe plant a flag in terms of our understanding of, of this issue and in, in terms of the problem? I know you, you metaphorically there made it clear in terms of the root, but is it, is it always in our perception of situations? Is it our inability to manage the emotional state? Is it, is it both? Where can we maybe plant a flag there? The flag that needs to be planted isn't in trying to change people's minds. The flag that needs to be planted is not in, in, in order to make people believe or to coax them away from that which they already believe. Mm. I'm not here to convince anybody of anything. The state of affairs are the way they are because the majority of human beings in any endeavor, in any discipline, in any field, in any country of the world are not interested in the truth. And no matter what anyone does, the majority will always remain the majority. There are, however, a very excruciatingly small minority of people who for whatever reason have the DNA to really want to know the truth. And those are the people who pretend to change the world. So the idea of planting a flag, that flag will not live in the soil in which it is planted. It'll be torn down tomorrow. Because it will, it will have been planted in an effort to change people's minds. And that doesn't, as, as, as it has been said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So if, if there is anything really worthwhile to say, it is that if there is anyone listening to this radio program right now, if he or she has the DNA to seek the truth, if you really desperately, genuinely, and sincerely want to know, then the first thing that you will admit is all of the things that you've heard do not work. And if they don't work, then it is incumbent upon you to have enough respect for yourself to walk away from them forever. I am only speaking to that minority of people who is genuinely interested in the truth. I have no interest in speaking to the masses. I have no interest in speaking to the people who couldn't care less about the truth 
They just want to spend their time wearing lanyards and going to conferences and talking with the four C's and the three D's. I'm not interested in that. I don't want to change anyone's mind. I'm here to give permission to those who already have the DNA to see what really is the truth. Well, and something that I think can help transition into another topic that I want you to expand upon is related to this idea of prescriptions and this idea of lanyards and the conference environment, like you mentioned, because although there you may be referred more to a convention for maybe psychologists or whatever it might be, this exists in all fields, soccer coaching, including uh, included with all the coaching courses that, that people go to. And what happens is, like you mentioned, they, they maybe come back with pieces of information that they feel are going to help them, prescriptions, if you will, and they just don't. They just don't mm-hmm. help them. And you, you can touch on that a little bit more, although I feel you, you've made that clear, but one of those things that I feel is clearly at fault in this arena is this idea or the idea of meditation as it's understood in pop culture. And I think I actually heard you either on a a previous podcast or in one of your discourses discuss if, if meditation as it's understood and mindfulness was so effective, then where are all the at peace people? Correct. (laughs) So maybe you can discuss that idea a little bit more. And, and maybe- yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to kill a lot of sacred cows tonight, aren't we? Um, yeah. uh, it, it's, this is yet just another manifestation of the underlying need of society to hang on and be attracted to shiny and bright lighted concepts. People are interested in the idea of things. They like the flowing robes, and they like the shining beacon on the hill, and they like the fancy colors, right? And they like the burning of the incense, and they like they like all those things because they they look nice and they sound nice, and they and it sounds proper and correct, and and it. But if it all depends upon where you want to go. You never leave your house, get in the car, and say, I wonder where I will go today. You always know exactly where you're going, and that's why whenever you get into your car, you never don't get there, because you know where you're going. So the, the, question, the question isn't, you know, Tim, Tim Ferriss and I had this conversation, uh, a very nice conversation, actually, a number of months ago, where he, where he said to me, he said, well, you know, there are those who have benefited from meditation. I said, absolutely right. But my question isn't what a benefit. My question isn't, is meditation helpful in some way? My question isn't, does it give you some sense of temporary enjoyment or peace or whatever it is? That isn't my question. My question is, does meditation bring you into a state of complete and total peace permanently? Does it give you enlightenment? Does it give you the, does it give you the experience of no self? Does it take you to a realm of nirvana? Does it take you to a place in which you are transformed? No, it doesn't. And once again, it doesn't matter what I say. Look at the evidence. Millions upon millions upon millions of people meditate. And do you know what most of the conversations are about afterwards? (laughs) How long was your meditation? Oh, mine was 10 minutes. I did 20 minutes last week. Who did you go see? Oh, I see see this teacher over here. Oh, he's very good. But the other guy's even better. Well, where do you go? I go to this very nice hall and the nice nice incense. Where do you go? I go down the street over here. That's what it's all about. It's it's, once again, it's it's a return to cosmetics. (laughs) The meditation is just another nightclub. It's all it is. It's a social Facebook. It's all it is. It's not real. Now, I will also tell you this. If you go to the Zen temples, 
they meditate for 10 plus hours a day. And most of them aren't enlightened. And that's all they do. So if we're talking about reaching ultimate places, to reaching ultimate realms, to real transformation, not temporary change, I would say from if that's the question, then no, meditation is a farce. Meditation, what is the truth? The truth is this. Meditation is an effect, not a cause. Hmm. It is the same as performance. I, I did an article for Lifehack called Why Meditation Has Failed You. You can just Google that and you'll see it. And essentially, the point was that meditativeness is far more effective and far more transformational than meditation. Taking 20 minutes of your day, if it was so important, if, if meditation was so grand, then why out of being awake for 12 to 14 hours a day or 16 hours a day, why would you only spend 20 minutes doing it? It's, 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 a, it's a scam, right? It's Once again, it's more societal garbage. Meditativeness is to lose yourself in whatever you are doing. That's transformational. There is no need for incense. There is no need for flowing robes. There is no need for chanting or gongs or priests or temples or group or, or social disingenuous gatherings. You don't need to go somewhere to meditate. You don't need to go somewhere to be silent. There's another one. Why do you have to go to a retreat to be silent? You need instruction for that too? You don't know how to be silent at home? These are all just for show. These are nice little dolls sitting in the, in the, in the, in the showcase. That's all it is. If you're serious, then meditativeness, there's something there. When you're washing the dishes, you lose yourself in them. And that is not mindfulness. Mindfulness is that I'm focusing on the water as it hits my hand. And it's, it's effortful and, 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 and there's a trying there. And it's against the grain and the mind is coming at you, but you're trying to keep the mind away. It's, 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 it's ineffective. And I'll throw you another bomb tonight. Most progress happens not through effort, but through effortlessness. The more effort that you must provide, the more against the tide you are, are swimming. If negative emotions came to you effortlessly, they must leave effortlessly. If the problem arose without effort, the cure is also without effort. All cures do not come through effort. They come through understanding. Well, one of the things, Kapil, that I have to bring up in that regard to meditation, and I believe you've written about this extensively, is, and maybe th this word's possibly not the best, but the intention behind why people turn to meditation. You mentioned the aesthetics of it earlier and the competition of, oh, I did 20 minutes and you only did 10. But in, in many ways, in speaking to the unseriousness of it, they are just, I guess, looking to meditation as a way to act as if they're making a change to themselves. But in reality, there's something about the way they are that they like, that they don't want to necessarily get rid of. Correct. Maybe you Correct. can un unpack that for us. Uh, essentially, the reason that most people do 
these kinds of things. Listen to, I mean, it happens in India all the time, right? You have, you'll have hundreds and thousands of people in, in the, in the audience listening to a guru speak and they all nod their head and, and shake their head and applaud and, you know, and the minute that they leave, they go back and they snap default right back in their lives. Nothing has changed. They're the same person when they return as they were when they left. Now, the reason that that happens is because they view the guru as an entertainment. That's all it is. It is an entertainment. The reason that meditation happens, the reason all these things happen is because it's, it's cosmesis. People are enamored with form. If they do these things, they have ammunition against their mind. When the mind says to them, see, you aren't doing anything to better yourself, they can say, yes, I am. See, I'm meditating. <laughs> see, I'm, I'm reading a self-help book. Don't you understand? See, I'm seeing this guru over here. See that? See, I'm reading all these spiritual books. Don't you understand? And the mind says, oh, okay, well, I guess you must be really trying to do something. It's all disingenuous. Now, I'm just giving you a reason why things happen. I'm not, I'm not here to say to those people that you shouldn't do that. I'm not here to say that you should be more sincere. I'm not telling anybody to do anything. I don't believe in should. I'm just answering your question as to why these things happen. Not that they shouldn't happen. If someone doesn't want to be sincere, then that's fine. If someone wants to play a game where they want to disingenuously go through these silent retreats, and who am I to say that they shouldn't? Perfectly fine. I'm just making a factual statement, an observation. This is the way, this is the nature of human beings. That human beings get exactly what they want. If they really desperately want something, they get it. And if they really desperately don't, they won't. And whatever happens in between is just cosmesis and form. Boy, and to that point, I, I've actually heard you use a metaphor before in regards to that of people always getting what they want, that I believe the the example you used that if somebody's hair was on fire, yes, they would find a way to put that fire out because it's yeah. If someone's hair's on fire, I promise you they wouldn't go to a scientist and say what part of my brain is lighting up. <laughs> okay, I promise they wouldn't look for the three Ds and the four Cs. I promise they wouldn't psychologize it and and make it scientific and put up pie charts and graphs. One way or another, within seconds to a minute, they would find a way to no longer be on fire. That's sincerity. That's genuine. Mm. There would be no how. There would just be, it has to be done. Man is a 12-hour creature. At 1159, he feels that he had one minute left. He doesn't act until his back's against the wall. That's the nature of human beings. Well, Kapil, in, in the in respect for your time, I, there's a if, if you do have a, a few spare minutes, there's a a few quotes that I have from you, or at least if I could get to one that sure. I'd, I'd like you to to unpack a little bit. And sure. so the the quote is, and it's recent, that I believe you put it on Twitter or possibly in a discourse again, but it said, I'll, I'll first read the quote and then I'll explain to you why I think there's a lot of parallels to sports and sports coaching. So it reads, if you truly examine your life in its most basic form, you come to the unspeakable realization that there's literally nothing to do on this earth. Anything you do grows old after it's done. Anything you attain loses its luster. Anyone you become is not enough. Now what? 
and, yes. and, and the reason why I, I like that is because as myself being an athlete and playing professionally and now coaching, I've been surrounded by teammates, athletes that I coach, other coaches that are obsessed with chasing results, whether it's a Super Bowl, the U.S. Open, the World Cup, whatever it mean, whatever it might be, the next win. But undoubtedly, it always fades to nothing. And, yes. and that leaves us ready to come back and chase it again. And in, in many ways, I feel what we're all searching for is just a way back to the present. We almost say to ourselves, if, if, if I could just win the World Cup, then I'd be able to enjoy this moment. Then, yes. then I could finally relax. And so I want you to, to unpack that quote a little bit more. But then also I wanted to see the question, because that, that's the one that I've been thinking about a lot is the when you say now what, what is maybe the implication there? So maybe unpack the question and then the now what, what, what should that, if there's, of course, there's maybe not an answer that we would have, but what was maybe the, the train of, or the idea there? The now what was essentially a boomerang to make you look at all the words that came before it. The now what was the sort of, hammer which forced you to look at the insignificance of everything in your life now as for winning the u.s open and and these things um the when you say that if i only win the u.s open then i'll be you know then i'll be happy The implication from that typically is that because the U.S. Open is insignificant, then it doesn't really matter if you win. Now, I will change that. And I will say that it is because it's insignificant that you're able to play it better and possibly have a greater chance of winning. So the insignificance ironically, frees you up to be more intense in your preparation and your play. When you come to a game looking to fill a hole within yourself, it is a no-win situation because the game is only a field. It doesn't have the ability to fill anybody. The only person who can truly play is the one who arrives whole. As long as you need something from it, you're its prisoner. And all the psychologizing in the world is not going to make you free. Well, that's... uh... (laughs) For me, Kapil, I think that will leave a maybe a boomerang uh, in reference to your mm-hmm. now what, where where they the coaches listening and the people listening will maybe go back and listen again. Uh, leave a little bit there to to be desired for the next next time we can have a maybe uh, conversation, hopefully in the future. But sure. I I don't want to leave our conversation without giving you a chance and pointing our listeners in the direction of some of the things that you've written and expanded upon in other forums. I know your own personal website. So if you want to maybe point people in the direction and anything else that you have to add uh, to tonight's conversation would be great. Sure. If they would like to read my messages that I post on Twitter. Um, I have two Twitter feeds. One of them is at Kapil Gupta MD and the other one is at Siddha Performance. 
and it's S-I-D-D-H-A, and the F-O-R is actually number four. Um, and my website is kapilguptamd.com, and I have another website, which is sid.performance.com. Um, they are welcome to go to my uh, website and uh, sign up for receiving my private discourses, uh, but if they do sign up, I will first ask who they are and what their level of sincerity is and, and, uh, tell me about themselves and, and I'll send them the private discourses. Um, so essentially I, I work with professional athletes, CEOs and celebrities, you know, performing artists, um, and, uh, very much, very, you know, not taking on actually many more clients right now uh, but it, it's essentially it's a it's a path to uh, going on a journey with the the people who are at the top of their profession um, to a journey towards freedom and truth something which really isn't espoused or uh, talked about, or in any meaningful way offered in today's society. Well, and to, to lastly add on to that, I'm also assuming that the clients you work with are small in number because I think you've referenced this as well before, the, the number of the serious is usually a, a group of people that could fit in a fairly small room, so... Yeah, if I have if I have uh, uh, three thousand clients, I've lost the message somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. This is yeah. This is for people who really want to go the final mile, all the way to the top of Everest, as I like to say. Uh, and but but I will say that they're they're small in number, they're small in percentage, but uh, the years have taught me that uh, there are actually more than I once thought there were. Mm. Um, when people like you come out of the woodwork and contact me and uh, it, it, it actually shines light on the fact that there actually is a, is a definite uh, percentage, albeit small, but a definite percentage of individuals who truly are tired of silliness and, uh, and really want to uh, devote what is a really a, uh, a sacred life that they have uh, to finding the truth. Well, and it's, it's funny you actually say that because when I first contacted you and obviously reading through your materials, I almost had to, I had to ask myself, honestly, how serious am I? Mm -hmm. You almost have to, I had to confront myself because the, the questions that you pose in your discourses and, and on Twitter are, are something that should be more examined or, or deeper examined, especially for yourself. So even this podcast has had me reflecting or looking in the mirror of myself as to some of the things we're, we're discussing. Well, we've lived for so long in a culture which, uh, which essentially is saturated with, you know, prescriptions and a regurgitated derivative um, ideas which go fundamentally against the way that human beings are really made uh, and, and goes against the way that human beings create and perform, that you become the environment in some ways. And it takes, and it oftentimes takes a very uh, rebellious person at heart who, who questions everything and who doesn't sort of believe anything um, to, to sort of uh, bring things to the fore, so to speak, and uh, and, and help attract those who have always felt that way in, in some portion of their DNA. Yeah, very good. And I really, again, have to thank you for, for spending you know, over an hour tonight uh, with me and just chatting. And again, like I said, off air when we first started talking, hopefully this was somewhat uh, useful for yourself as well. And uh, I know it was useful for me and I believe it will be for the listeners as well. And, with that said, hopefully in the future we can have a uh, more discussions. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the invite. And uh, 
and look forward to talking to you again in the future.